30 people 30 people connected so let's let's start and people will just join us uh, with time so it is a great pleasure to introduce uh, professor Gennady Bokarov he's at uh, the Rus he's um, at the Institute of Numerical Mathematics of the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow and he is um, kind of a landmark in the study of the mathematical modeling of uh, immune system and uh, viral dynamics within host. And we are very much looking forward to uh, today's presentation, Gennady. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Santiago. And I mean, first of all, I would like to express my severe thanks to the organizers of, of, of I mean, of this conference for the opportunity to give a talk and to, and to present. Uh, some results of our collaborative work with uh, with my colleagues from the Institute of Numerical Mathematics and from University of Pompeo Fabra from the group of, from, of Andreas Meyerhans, as indicated in the in this co-authors list. And the outline of my of my talk can be structured. I mean, uh, I mean, actually, around the following four teams. First, I would like to present some, um, I mean, background related to the systems approach to immunology, and then we. Um, consider uh, those aspects of the immune system functioning and mathematical modeling, which are considered to be relevant for gaining a, 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 an integrative understanding of how the immune system functions and protects uh, the body against, I mean, pathogens, uh, in particular, the I mean, viruses. We, so we consider the structure of the immune system, uh, the, the I mean, regulation of immune responses to, I mean, to, I mean, virus infections and the, I mean, the, and the analysis of, of uncertain, um, I mean, data which characterize the dynamics of immune responses. I mean, first of all, of course, it is important to, um, to, um, to highlight the extreme complexity of the immune system. It's a body-wide network of the primary and secondary lymphoid organs, as is shown in this figure, uh, in a very uh, simple way, uh, and uh, and it consists of about five to five hundred to one thousand uh, lymph nodes, which um, uh, which are I mean connected by um, by uh, lymphatic vessels. And this this lymph node, this uh, set of lymph nodes. Um, uh, I mean, also in a very basic uh, manner presented by this scheme, uh, together with the, with, with the spleen, uh, uh, um, considered as a secondary lymphoid organs where the immune responses to, uh, I mean, pathogens take place. And also there are, of course, uh, I mean, primarily, uh, I mean, lymphoid organs, which consist of the bone marrow uh, and, I mean, thymus, which, um, uh, which I mean function to I mean to I mean generate the I mean precursors of B cells and T cells uh, I mean respectively and uh, and the, and and the cells of the immune innate immune system. In order to uh, to um, I mean understand the I mean functioning of the immune system, one needs to consider three three I mean types of processes which I mean different in I mean then I mean nature and in terms of the mathematics which is which is needed to describe them. So uh, the first uh, set are the so-called physical uh, I mean processes which are related to the transport and diffusion phenomena. Um, the second global set is, uh, um, uh, I mean, chemical process, which, um, you, which, um, uh, I, I mean, are represented by signal transduction, I mean, cascades, the, I mean, ligand receptor interaction, and the, uh, um, I mean, I mean, protein, I mean, synthesis, and the last set, which is most complex um, uh, in terms of the difficulty to describe it, I mean, mathematically. Is the uh, are the so-called biological processes, which uh, which I mean relate to which I mean refer to cell division, uh, cell fate regulation, um, I mean generation of um, uh, antigen specific cell diversity in the immune system, and of course um, uh, the second complexity or, or in um, of of the immune system is I mean related to the extreme phenotypic I mean diversity of the cells which. Which compose the um, uh, the um, the immune system and uh, which are responsible for the responses of the innate part of the immune system. These are macro, I mean, I mean macrophages, dendritic cells, 
and also T lymphocytes, uh, B lymphocytes, and T I mean lymphocytes, which are responsible for producing uh, anti uh, uh, specific I mean antibodies and um, uh, the generation of cytotoxic T cells, which uh, function to destroy I mean virally infected cells. And in turn, the these cells are not, uh, I mean, homogeneous with respect to the number of receptors of, I mean, different origin that they express on their, I mean, surfaces. So these uh, sources of, I mean, I mean, heterogeneity generate, um, I, I mean, really a range of questions which are, uh, I mean, difficult to to address uh, in, I mean, mathematical models, um, and these are. I mean, related to the physical compartments, to the uh, to the array of uh, distinct cell population, and the I mean heterogeneity of expression of specific markers, or if one studies, for example, proliferation of cells, uh, the fluorescent labels, which uh, which uh, that uh, which are used to I mean characterize the efficacy of the immune responses. So, in order to proceed uh, and to um, to, to, I mean, proceed um, with, I mean, mathematical modeling. One should uh, specify the, philo uh, I mean, physiologically relevant questions, which are, I mean, related to the, uh, uh, the to the, I mean, pathogenesis of infectious, I mean, diseases, and they are schematically shown here. So, uh, as as far as the infection or with, I mean, virus of a human or, I mean, experimental, I mean, animal is concerned, one can distinguish four different, uh, I mean, phenotypically different types of uh, of the uh, infection trajectory dynamics. So the most favorable one is uh, so-called subclinical uh, infection or asymptotic or asymptomatic. I mean, in, I mean, I mean, infection. Uh, the I mean, the I mean, other um, uh, type is the so-called acute infection, which is characterized by by the rise in the in the viral load or, or the I mean bacterial load, and then characterized by complete elimination below the detection threshold, or I mean, to uh, or to a sterile uh, sterile state uh, due to the I mean efficient and uh, I mean timely immune response. If there are some problems with the uh, with the um, with the induction of antigen specific or innate immune responses, then this can lead to a little infection, which is marked here by by the dotted red line. And the um, and uh, I mean another situation is uh, when the pathogen is not cleared from from the host and a chronic I mean persistent infection is established. So and the fundamental question are um, um, are the I mean following one. What are the what could be the uh, I mean origins of this uh, of this I mean different phenotypes of infection I mean dynamics and how one can dissect the I mean control parameters. And of course uh, uh, one could I mean contrast two I mean different approaches to to, 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 I mean, this topic. One is, I mean, represented by so-called clinicians, I mean, perspective. And the other one is uh, the, I mean, perspective, which is provided by, um, by I mean, those who are doing, uh, I mean, mathematical modeling. So in, in terms of the, I mean, perspective of an immunologist, and you can see here, Professor Rolf Zinkenagel, who got a Nobel Prize in, I mean, immunology in 1996. The, uh, outcome of, of infection results from the numbers game between the infectious, I mean, agent and the immune system. And the numbers game is interpreted in terms of the, uh, I mean, categories and, I mean, notions which um, sometimes are difficult to quantify or to, I mean, to provide, a, I mean, coordinatization of them. So it's cytopathicity of the viruses, the uh, immunopathology, the, I mean, tissue tropism, uh, some of them are, uh, I mean, really quantifiable, uh, like the I mean, replication rate. The health condition of the of the infected, I mean, individual is a is a rather weak um, is a rather weak, uh, I mean, category which is difficult to I mean, quantify. And from the mathematical point of view, one um, uh, if one I mean manages to I mean formulate a system of equations which describes the population dynamics of the of the infection. Of the virus, in, I mean, infection uh, and the immune response, um, um, then one could try to estimate the, I mean, parameters of the, 
of the equations and to understand and interpret the I mean numbers game in terms of the I mean parameters of the immune response and the virus replication. Um, due to uh, um, to, due to an impressive, um, uh, I mean, advances in experimental technologies of, I mean, measuring various aspects of the immune system functioning at the genetic level, at the cell population level, at the, at, at the individual cell level, and the level of uh, um, specific tissues and, I mean, organs and the whole, I mean, organism level. Now the, I mean, challenge is how to integrate all this information across, uh, um, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, multiple, I mean, multiple of scales, using I mean mathematical models. And to this end, they exist and are actively developed, um, uh, are being actively developed. Uh, I mean, a range of mathematical techniques, and I mean types of mathematical models, which are, which are I mean represented by deterministic or I mean stochastic, I mean, ordinary differential equations, or I mean, stochastic differential equations, partial differential equation, I mean, agent-based models, cellular ports models, and the hybrid models, which, I mean, which uh, are, I mean, formulated to integrate across, I mean, a number of scales. And some examples of those I will show in my, I mean, presentation. Actually, the system's approach to immunology was, um, uh, was um, clearly established in, in, in this particular branch of, I mean, biology as early as uh, 40 years, I mean, ago. And it was uh, an excellent paper published in the, I mean, proceedings of the, of the, uh, I mean, engineering journal, uh, which is called a systems approach to, I mean, uh, I mean, immunology. And what is considered now to be a systems approach to, uh, to, I mean, immunology is, was, I mean, nicely formulated by Roger Sinkernagel in his paper. Uh, and, and he stated that understanding uh, cellular physiology uh, and molecular details, usually summarized by term systems biology or systematically completed measured biology are eventually necessary to understand the strengths and weaknesses of immune defenses. In order to proceed with, I mean, formulating mathematical models, one need to have uh, the following, I mean, triad, or, uh, uh, which um, is, of absolute importance for advancing physiologically, I mean, relevant mathematical models and to apply them in order to describe, analyze and predict certain features of the, of the, I mean, infectious diseases and their, I mean, pathogenesis. So one needs, of course, to have, uh, I mean, experimental data and, and uh, I mean, proceed, uh, should be able to proceed with the analysis of the big data and, I mean, mathematical modeling. But what is also important is the availability of theoretical concepts and hypothesis, because, I mean, without that, it is very difficult to, I mean, formulate a, a consistent, uh, I mean, mathematical model. Uh, in order to achieve a system level understanding in immunology, one needs to look at the structure, design principles, regulation, and the dynamics of the immune responses and how they, these, these things can be revealed from, I mean, empirical data. So concerning the structure uh, uh, of, the, of the immune system, uh, the immune responses generally, uh, take place in the secondary lymphoid organs, uh, mainly, I mean, represented by uh, lymph nodes, as shown in this figure, and the spleen. And now we have, uh, I mean, excellent data, which allow one to proceed with the generation, uh, with the establishment of the computational models of the, of the, mm, I mean, of, of, I mean, lymph nodes. So. Um, I mean, having the data provided by, uh, I mean, imaging of the internal structures of the lymph node, in particular, for example, the set of fibroblastic reticular cell, uh, cell networks as shown in this figure, one can, um, one can uh, produce the, I mean, histograms, which, I mean, characterize the topological, pro uh, I mean, properties of, of this network, which is a, uh, backbone of any, 
uh, of, I mean, every lymph node. So one can have the, I mean, histograms of the degree distribution of the fibroblastic reticular cell network and the distribution of edge lengths which connect the, uh, I mean, individual fibroblastic, uh, I mean, reticular cells. With this kind of information, one can proceed with, uh, with, I mean, generation, with, I mean, generation of the network graph model uh, that is used as a backbone to produce a voxel-based uh, uh, structure of the fibroblastic reticular cell network, and then uh, get a smooth solid model of the local, uh, I mean, structure of, of, of the, I mean, leaf node. And in this way, one can also integrate the uh, blood, blood, I mean, uh, um, um, blood, I mean, vessels, which, um, which enter the lymph node and assemble a computational model of the lymph node, which considers, which, which actually describes and, I mean, represents all, impo all I mean, uh, key structures of a lymph node. So it's a subcapsular sinus, it's the B cell follicles, it's the set of the fibroblastic reticular networks and the, I mean, conduit system, the, I mean, uh, the blood, um, I mean, vascular network, the medullar network, the trabecular sinuses, as shown in this figure. And with this kind of uh, computational models, uh, I mean, of the, um, uh, of the lymph node geometry, one can proceed with developing the spatially resolved mathematical models of the immune responses to, I mean, foreign, I mean, antigens. Uh, lymph nodes are assembled in the human body into a spatial structure, which is called the human lymphatic system. And the graph of the human lymphatic system, which can be generated from the available anatomical plastic boy data are shown in this figure. Then one can, uh, um, then, um, then one can apply a simple description of the lymphatic, of the lymph flow in the lymphatic system in order to produce an oriented graph of the human, I mean, I mean lymphatic system based on the, um, based on the, I mean, on the analysis of the total balance of the lymph um, uh, of the lymph uh, flow uh, through the I mean lymphatic system, and finally one can uh, I mean produce um, um, uh, I mean a graph of the human lymphatic system which is amenable to a mathematical I mean analysis and it can be used to study effectively the I mean robustness of the uh, of the human lymphatic system to I mean various. Uh, I mean, perturbation and changes in its, I mean, structure. And the details of this kind of, I mean, analysis has been published last year in, in, the, in the paper, which is, I mean, cited here. Uh, as far as the regulation is concerned, I would like first to start with, um, with an example of um, a success story when Mathematical model was applied to understand the, I mean, limits of protection, which are, uh, um, uh, which is, I mean, provided by the innate type one interferon immune response. So the question we would like, we, uh, we, I mean, addressed by a combination of uh, mathematical modeling and analysis of experimental data generated by our colleagues in at the Institute of Experiment or at the Institute of Immunobiology in St. Gallen was how robust is the type one interferon mediated protection against severe, I mean, cytopathic infection. And this was, this kind of analysis was inspired by, by the, um, by the analysis, by uh, by the by the I mean I mean information published some time ago in I mean science, saying that the um, the um, the I mean influenza virus, which caused a global I mean pandemic, uh, um, I mean. Um, I, I mean, phenomenon in I mean 1980 and led to to the deaths of more than 20 million people, is characterized by a, I mean, relative increase of the exponential growth rate of the virus, and what you can see from these I mean growth experiments in epithelial in the human I mean epithelial cells of upper I mean respiratory I mean tract. Uh, so the I mean little 
strain of the virus is, I mean, characterized by only 33% increase in the, in the growth rate of the virus. And the question was, is, uh, is it um, too much for the immune system? And uh, can the immune system cope with this kind of, with this scale of, I mean, of increase? And, under, and what are the, I mean, conditions uh, uh, for which, uh, which are, which are unfavorable for the immune system to control this kind of, in, of I mean, increase in the, I mean, I mean, replicative capacity of the virus. And, and these kind of questions were addressed using an experimental coronavirus infection model. Um, this is a mouse hepatitis, um, I mean, virus infection, for which it is known, for this infection, it is known that the control of the virus over the first uh, 48 hours is, I mean, mediated by type one interferon, I mean, response, as can be seen from, from I mean, this figure. The antigen specific uh, CTL response comes later and it's uh, for the control of infection of, I mean, primary importance is, the, uh, is a prompt and timely and strong uh, type one interferon, I mean, response. In order to develop a mathematical model that um, that can be used to address this question of the sensitivity of the infection outcome to the uh, to the variations in the growth of the I mean virus, one can use a plethora of data which I mean characterize this experimental system in vitro, uh, in vivo, and uh, and. Um, in vivo for, I mean, systemic infections with high, I mean, viral, I mean, doses. Uh, to implement the um, qualitatively consistent mathematical model, one, uh, of course, one can use, I mean, various, I mean, approaches. What, uh, what was used in this particular study is a maximum likelihood, I mean, parameter estimation. And based on the maximum likelihood, parameter, I mean, parameter estimation, the information theoretic criteria for model, I mean, ranking. Uh, the uncertainty in the parameter, I mean, estimates were, um, I mean, analyzed using, I mean, various approaches like the, I mean, variance covariance, um, I mean, analysis, the profile likelihood based analysis, bootstrap, I mean, analysis in order to, to find, uh, I mean, robust, um, in order to generate, a, I mean, robust, I mean, assessment of the uncertainty in the, I mean, parameter values. And in order to implement this kind of multi-scale model of MHV infection in mice, we first, I mean, formulated a basic module of the infection and type one interferon response in the cells of the innate immune system. Uh, so the cells of the, uh, these are plasma cytonic dendritic cells, macrophages, both are, can be infected by the virus and both produce type one interferon. Then this was um, scaled up to a spleen and then the model was I mean, further expanded to consider the processes in spleen, blood, and I mean, liver. And we had available data that can be used to, I mean, calibrate this kind of, uh, I mean, um, uh, multi-compartmental model. So this is an elementary module of reaction. This is a set of equations. It's a, it's a kind of a delayed, I mean, differential equations, which, I mean, describes the production of the virus, synthesis of type one interferon, and the infection process of, of the, I mean, target cells. Then the model was, I mean, calibrated and validated by comparison with the, I mean, data, for example, on the, I mean, effect of recombinant interferon. And this way, it was possible to formulate and to expand the model to, to consider a systemic uh, infection of, um, of, uh, of experimental mice with, the, with this, I mean, coronavirus. As uh, shown in this figure, uh, and, by, uh, uh, and the model is detailed by this set of equations. Um, this kind of analysis, I mean, uh, I mean provided a very interesting quantitative, in, I mean, insight into the efficacy of type one interferon production, for example, by plasma cytoic dendritic cells and the macrophages. And it appeared for, it appeared, for example, that the, that the rate of production of type one interferon by single PDC is about 100 fold larger than uh, by a single infected, I mean, macrophage. But the production of the virus by PDCs is about 
uh, 20 times smaller than the production of, uh, of this I mean, corona coronavirus by I mean, macrophages. But what was important finally is shown in this figure. It was possible to predict with this model the degree of robustness of protection against the fast replicating uh, I mean, coronavirus strain in relation to its preferential site of, I mean, I mean, replication. And it appeared that if, if the, uh, if the, I mean, virus strains, um, I mean, replicate mainly in the, in the cells of the lymphoid organs like spleen or lymph nodes, these are, I mean, macrophages or, I mean, dendritic cells, that the, uh, that the degree of robustness provided by the um, type one interferon system is extremely high. One can induce the, I mean, I mean, I mean, basal, the, I mean, basal replication rate of the virus by tenfold, twentyfold, and it's still the severity of uh, uh, of infection, which is, I mean, measured experimentally by the level of, I mean, alumin transaminase is below the, uh, I mean, the, the, I mean, threshold, which is not consistent with the life. So the test of the animals, but if the, I mean, virus strains uh, replicate faster in, I mean, peripheral, I mean, or in, I mean, peripheral tissues, like for example, uh, in, in this particular infection, the, I mean, hepatocytes, then, uh, I mean, very modest increase by 10%, 20% of the virus growth rate leads to a little infection. So the conclusion is that the innate immune um, system can provide a robust protection against the infection, which is localized in lymphatic organs, but not, uh, um, uh, but not against the infection, which is localized in the I mean, peripheral organs. And with this, and with this finding, we, we uh, I mean, we can conclude that the 33% of increase of the little influenza strain, uh, this uh, 1980 strain, is quite high, uh, and and the and the I mean protection uh, is um, not uh, for such an infection, which takes place in the epithelial cells of the upper respiratory I mean tract, is not uh, I mean guaranteed by the immune system. Uh, now I would like to show uh, to move from this multi-compartmental model to an example of a, 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 to an example of, of a multi-scale, I mean modeling of the HIV infection. As one can see from 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 this scheme, uh, HIV infection is I mean characterized in a typical progressor by an acute phase of infection, then uh, I mean followed by. Um, uh, by a slow increase in the viral load and um, and the slow decrease of the uh, blood CD4 T cell, I mean count. And, I mean, contrast uh, to this typical progress, uh, there are some other I mean phenotypes of infection dynamics. I mean, for, shown for example here, uh, which are referred to as elite controllers. Well, when we have a Certain decline when one has uh, when one can when uh, in which one observes a certain decline of blood, blood CD4 t, t cell count and actually uh, quite low um, uh, I mean level of um, uh, of I mean of the viral load and the question of course um, is what is the difference between those two I mean phenotypes uh, and uh, can one use certain a certain, I mean, approaches to uh, impu to improve the functional cure of the HIV-infected individuals. And to answer this question, one need to uh, to take into account a multi-scale and multi-physics nature of HIV infection. So uh, it spans a, 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 a wide range of the, I mean, of the, I mean, physical scales and the, and the, I mean, temporal scales. And some examples of the modules which are available now for studying the um, uh, the pathogenesis of HIV infection in a multi-scale, um, under a multi-scale, I mean, framework, I, I will just uh, show now. So the, uh, the first, uh, we, I mean, developed a so-called computational platform for, for uh, I mean, hybrid multi-scale modeling of HIV infection. It considers the following compartments. So the lymph node and the blood. In blood, one can observe viral load, CD4 T cell count, CDL T cell count. 
And what happens, and these are the consequences of the processes which take place in, 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 in the system of, um, of, of the infected lymph nodes. Uh, so um, there are infected cells, uh, I mean, uninfected cells, cytotoxic T lymphocytes, and um, um, which, I mean, function to create certain spatial fields of free, I mean, variants, and the cytokine fields like interleukin-2, type 1 interferon, interferon gamma, and fast I mean, I mean ligand. I uh, show here only those that were, I mean, considered in, in the model that we, I mean, formulated. And the cells uh, are not static, they migrate in the lymph node. And to consider this migration, we use the Newton's second um, law of, I mean, motion. Uh, and uh, the individual cell fate regulation was um, modeled using an agent based I mean, approach. How does it look uh, this in, I mean, reality? So for every cell in this multi-scale model, we consider the uh, intracellular concentration of the, uh, of the signaling factors, which in our particular, uh, I mean, model, uh, I mean, refer to, I mean, interleukin-2, interferon, um, then the, uh, uh, the, I mean, fast, I mean, ligand, uh, induced, um, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, signaling and regulatory factors which uh, induce uh, the um, the network of, I mean, caspases, which finally can lead to, I mean, apoptosis, of, I mean, of the cells. And depending of the thresholds which were, uh, um, I mean, gathered from available, I mean, experimental data, the cell, I mean, either proliferates or it differentiates or it goes to I mean, apoptosis, or it does, I mean, nothing. And this is described within a single cell by a set of ordinary differential equations. The, um, the uh, cytokine, the cytokine fields and the, and the, and the spatial density of these, of the free virus particles is, I mean, governed by reaction diffusion equations, which are uh, shown as an example uh, on this uh, slide. And this is just an example of how the um, uh, the uh, spatial, uh, I mean, I mean, if, uh, how the spatial distribution of the virions and cytokines evolves. I mean, I mean, over time. So at the seven post infection, the the twelve post infection, and the interaction between cells is described by the second uh, uh, law of uh, I mean Newton. And the challenge was to quantify the to quantify the I mean forces which interact which describe the I mean interaction the repulsion and attraction between I mean different cells and the active motility of the cells. Uh, and the example of the of the view of a hybrid model which considers the individual dynamics of cells via this stochastic. Uh, differential equation, the cytokine fields, which um, which is um, a, and the I mean virion uh, I mean density in the computational domain, which is described here by reaction diffusion equation, the probability of inter of infection of I mean single cells by free I mean virions and by I mean neighboring uh, infected T cells and the intracellular replication of, of the I mean virus. Uh, is uh, shown as an example with this set of equation. It's, it, it's a typical example of how the a hybrid multiphysics model uh, can look like. And here we just have, an, just as an example, the spreading of HIV, I mean, variants in the computational domain, the, um, uh, the, uh, and uh, this red dot is a uh, infected dendritic cells, which is the source of the of the virus. Um, or, uh, I mean, spreading in this computational domain, the secretion of type one interferon. I mean, molecules, and here uh, the uh, analysis of the global dynamics of the of the I mean, viral load with respect to the availability of CTLs and type one interferon. Uh, responses, and what is important is that the is that the process which happen in a lymph node, this is the last 
last row can be directly linked to what is observed in the in 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 a blood compartment and uh, one can see that this kind of um, dynamics i mean correspond to an acute infection where we have the uh, drop of the uninfected cd4 t cell number the increase of, of the viral load uh, and i mean subsequent and subsequent reduction to a viral set point the i mean dynamics of um, infected t cells and the cd8 t cell responses so basically this kind of exercise shows that we can produce that one can produce a mathematical model which describes uh, um, I, I mean, under which I mean, implements a multi-scale approach to describe such, uh, a, I mean, such a complex infection as, I mean, HIV, I mean, infection. But then one can focus on individual, um, I mean, modules of this multi-scale, uh, I mean, framework, and, for example, produce a very detailed model of the intracellular life cycle of uh, of of, I mean, HIV type one. Um, then by, I mean, calibrating this, uh, um, I mean, this, I mean, mathematical model, one can do a sensitivity analysis. I mean, for example, for the total amount of the, of the, I mean, of the, I mean, of the virions released by an infected cells with respect to I mean, various parameters appearing in the model, and then quantify and select and identify those who, who that um, that have the strongest impact on the on the total. Uh, I, I mean, I mean, amount of the of the viral. I mean, progeny. I mean, released from in infected cells, and by ranking them according to this I mean, sensitivity, one is the highest, two is uh, uh, two, three, four, five. I mean, etc. One can actually use this I mean, calibrated model in order to predict, I mean, for example, and to try to identify some novel targets for, uh, for, I, mean, for, um, for I, mean, uh, I mean, plausible uh, drug I mean, development. I mean, for example, it was established that the, um, that the strongest impact on the viral I mean, progeny um, um, has the I mean, parameters which which I mean, which specify the dependence of the virus production on GAC, so I mean virus, I mean assembly, and the TATREF, uh, uh, I mean regulation of HIV, uh, uh, of HIV uh, transcription and translation, I mean, I mean events. Then one can focus, move on to um, to a systemic scale of HIV infection, as and it, as it was presented, as it was briefly uh, outlined before. Um, try to understand what 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 could be the I mean parameters uh, I mean underlying di I mean different phenotypes of HIV infection ranging from um, uh, I mean progressors to slow progressors to long term non I mean progressors and here one can see six um, uh, I mean officially um, uh, I mean documented and uh, I mean categorized phenotypes of HIV infection. Then the question uh, that was uh, studied using um, uh, the I mean, mathematical modeling of uh, HIV infection was the I mean, following one. It is well known that uh, um, T cells and B cells in HIV infection are I mean, characterized by so-called um, exhaustion I mean, phenotype. And one can use um, the immune checkpoint inhibitors in order to, uh, to um, help them to regain their function. And this, um, and the, and the, I mean, uh, and the necessary clinical and experimental data were, I mean, provided in, uh, at the University of, uh, uh, I mean, Pompeo Fabra by the group of, I mean, Andreas, I mean, Meyer Hans. And the, and the question is, was the following. Can one use the I mean model to to predict the effect of PD I mean ligand one blockade on HIV infection I mean control, and to this end um, one need to consider in the model the I mean effect of I mean antibody to PDL one on uh, on the on the on the function of CD8 T cells CD4 T cells and uh, I mean potentially B cells. Uh, or, one can use uh, uh, the, uh, I mean, study was based on the, I mean, following. Um, our colleagues considered this HIV GAC specific CD8 T cell stimulation 
uh, via CFC dilution, I mean, analysis. Um, using mathematical model, we were able to, I mean, convert the, I mean, data into the estimates of the kinetic parameters of the CD8 T cell proliferation or the static parameter uh, of CD8 proliferation. And the same applies to the CD4 um, uh, T cell I mean, count. And then by considering uh, six different phenotypes of HIV infection and having this clinical data on five different patients, why are a rather sophisticated by, uh, I mean, absolutely, I mean, logical scheme of the analysis, we were able, uh, and we, and with the, I mean, with the development or with the, I mean, mathematical model, which describes the population dynamics of uninfected, infected T cells, affected T cells, and I mean, viruses, um, that was expanded to consider the generation structure of CD8 T cells and CD4 T cells, we were able actually to predict the impact of the uh, PD ligand one blockade on revitalization of CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells. This was expressed in terms of, of, of the uh, increased CD8 T cell precursor, for, I mean, frequency, as well as uh, in, in, in the form of the doubling time of um, CD8 T, T, I mean, T cells. And then, it was possible via uh, the, I mean, mathematical analysis to predict what could be the effect of the blockade of um, PD, um, of the, I mean, ligand two, I mean, PD one, I mean, receptor, on the gain of the CD4 T cell number and the reduction of the viral load. And this um, and this uh, uh, and these predictions generated by a model are shown here, and basically, they uh, they I mean characterize what what would be the gain in terms of the CD4 T cell number or the reduction of the viral load marked here by uh, by a blue uh, I mean color for a different degree of the restoration of the CD4 T cells, and. The net effect is the I mean following. So the effect of the PD ligand one blockade on HIV load and CD4 T cell number depends on the interplay between the I mean positive and negative effects on the CD4 T cells, CD8 T cells, and B cell lymphocyte. I mean I mean activation. And for a physiologically relevant range of the affected model, I mean parameters, it is likely to be overall beneficial, but it strongly depends on the phenotypes of an infection. And uh, then we use the, I mean, module of the hybrid, I mean, uh, multi-scale, I mean, model, which describes the individual T cell motility in order to understand how many uh, CD4, T, CD8 T cells should be available in the, in the lymphoid tissue to provide a prompt, uh, um, uh, I mean, a prompt, uh, prompt, I mean, elimination of an infected um, cell. It is well known from, uh, I mean, studies of the life cycle of HIV in a T cell line that the production of the, I mean, of the, uh, of the mature, I mean, virions starts at about 18 hours post infection. So uh, the window of opportunity is just 18 hours. And if we consider a 2D, um, uh, a 2D uh, computational domain with one infected cell in it, uh, then one can um, uh, formulate the, f the I mean, following, uh, following, I mean, research task. How many CD8 T cells, I mean, antigen specific, should be in this computational domain in order to locate the infected cells within 18, uh, within 18 hours, so before the release of the infectious, I mean, uh, I mean, variants starts. And to this end, we, I mean, calibrate the, I mean, model of T cell motility in the T cell zone of lymph nodes was calibrated using according to the experimental data on the translation speed. So, so these are the data on the I mean, histograms of the distribution of um, the, uh, um, of the, of the, I mean, velocity of of the cells of the on the, uh, I mean, turning angle, um, I mean, distribution and the, uh, I mean, meandering, I mean. 
I mean indices. And this can be used in order to calibrate the, uh, the I mean, parameters and the functional forms which appear in the right-hand side of this second Newton's law. Uh, of, uh, and one can see the individual trajectories of the cells in this computational domain shown here by, I mean, different colors. But what is important, that with this calibrated model uh, of, of, of the spatial CTL, I mean, I mean, motility, it was possible to estimate the fraction of the antigen specific CD8 T cells that have to be present in, in, the, in a lymph node in order to eliminate uh, uh, the infected cell, the infected cells uh, before, I mean, uh, during the first, I mean, 18 hours. And it appears that the, the I mean, number should be about five, I mean, percent. Um, uh, if we, I mean, consider, for example, the uh, as an infected cell, the I mean, dendritic cells. It is, uh, it is, I mean, different for uh, when we consider a motile CD8 T cell, which is, I mean, infected. But if we consider the impact of the fibrosis and assume that it reduces by twofold or by 15% the, uh, I mean, translational speed of the T cells, then it appears that the number of, um, of, uh, 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 CD8 specific T cells should be increased by the, I mean, by, uh, by, uh, I mean, factor of, um, uh, by, uh, by a factor of uh, two to four, I mean, depending on the, on the types of cells that we, I mean, consider. So uh, the conclusion from this kind of, I mean, analysis is, is the following one. So in order to locate promptly the infected dendritic cells in a, in, a, in, in the T in T cell zone of the lymph node, the number of CTLs should be of HIV specific CDLs should be about five. I mean percent. Uh, this time reduces to four hours for productively infected CD4 T cells because they are motile and the and the frequency of their um, I mean random uh, uh, I mean collision with the antigen specific cells is is higher. Uh, but and f but if the it, if the Motility of T cell of antigen specific CD8 T cell is reduced by twofold. Then the then the detection of um, an infected cell, uh, I mean within 24 hours, I mean reduces uh, from 84 or 0.84 to about uh, 0.42. If the initial frequency of CD8 T cell is about one, I mean percent. This is the this kind of data. So, and finally, uh, I will briefly show the interesting aspect of analysis of the CFSC, um, uh, I mean, dilution, um, uh, I mean, assay, which is used to quantify, uh, to, to quantify the proliferation rate of, uh, of, I mean, T cells and B cells. Of course, it is very important uh, that we, one has a very clear generation peak, peaks which can be uh, which are related to the to the to 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 the different number of cell divisions the cell uh, have I mean I mean undergone, but unfortunately in I mean many of the data for, I mean for example these are experimental data with retrogenic CD8 T cells, this kind of uh, uh, generation structure is not is not I mean readily I mean. I mean, available. And in order to, uh, to I mean, analyze them, this one has to consider the, um, uh, one should relax um, essentially the basic assumption which underlies the CFSC-based analysis. So one, uh, in, I mean, I, I mean, under normal condition, one assumes that the uh, CFSC amount is splitted, um, uh, um, I mean, symmetrically between the, I mean, daughter cells. So 50% goes to one daughter cell, 50% to other daughter cells. If we have initial distribution of CFSC, I mean, labeled population, like uh, like a very clear and, I mean, narrow peak, then, then the this generation structure will be preserved with time. But if the degree of asymmetry is larger, for, for example, 42, uh, I mean, percent of the CFSC uh, dye goes to uh, one cell and 52 to, goes to another cell, then this initial uh, structure is lost. And after, I mean, for example, as shown here by, by the results of the simulation, after four days, we have a complete uh, loss of the of the I mean structure, uh, and this creates a fundamental problem uh, for the I mean for the analysis of the proliferation rate. To cope with this, we considered the uh, a, a new type of I mean mathematical model, which 
uh, moves uh, from moves away from the uh, single population growth rate uh, described by the exponential row or the I mean or the I mean logistic growth to to the to the to the models which to the compartment in, I mean models in which the um, cell population is structured. I mean, around the number of uh, cell, I mean, divisions the cells have undergone, or to the um, to the distributed parameter system in which cells differ with respect to the fluorescent label they express, and we formulated a new type of I mean model which considers the um, as a function of time the number of cell uh, cells which differ in terms with respect to this uh, to the number of divisions they have undergone and the expression of the CFSC label. And in order to be able to consider this, I mean, asymmetric division, which is shown in this figure, the time lag which is needed for cell to progress through the cell cycle, one has to formulate an old type of hyperbolic partial differential equation model with time delay. And uh, the example of this model is shown here. This is quite, uh, quite um, uh, I mean, unusual model because it's a hyperbolic, nonlinear and time delay, I mean, model, which uh, exactly describes the asymmetry in the dilution of CFSC between the I mean, daughter cells. But one can see that it allows a perfect description of the histograms of the distribution of CFSC, which evolve with, with I mean, time. Uh, as compared to a model in which the asymmetry is not considered. This is a grayish, uh, the gray, I mean, areas show the histograms of the, of the distribution of CFSC uh, with time, how they evolve with time from zero to four days. And one can see that the consistency of the, of the model, which doesn't consider symmetry is not, uh, is not good at all with the experimental data. And finally, with this kind of, I mean, I mean, modeling, we can predict using the model, the generation structure, the I mean, generation structure of the proliferating cells, which I mean, uh, which are I mean, characterized by a very broad distribution of the initial CFSE, uh, I mean, labeling, and uh, as a consequence by, I mean, overlapping, um, I mean, overlapping, I mean, generation of CFSE labeled T cells as shown here, for example, at uh, the, at, um, I mean, 72 hours post-infection, we have a mix of the population which, uh, of cells which, which are naive, divided one time, two times, three times, four times, et cetera. And the model exactly specifies this. Also the, I mean, data uh, cannot be used to, to um, to to um, uh, to be I mean subdivided or to be I mean to be I mean categorized in terms of the of the superposition of the individual I mean generations. And finally, at the end of my talk, I would like to briefly show the, our recent studies, which, uh, which aims at um, formulating a model of the intracellular life cycle of SARS-CoV-2. And we uh, I mean, managed to calibrate the individual biochemical reaction steps and via sensitivity analysis, again, we identify the most sensitive stages of the virus replication, which has a strongest impact on the total, I mean, progeny of the virus, which is I mean, produced. And now, uh, this is my last slide. We are at the stage uh, at, of, I mean, formulating a multi-scale model in which we would like to understand what are the factors which contribute to subclinical infection, to acute infection, or, or I mean, hypertoxic lethal infection. This is an ongoing, I mean, process, and it will link both the innate and the antispecific responses in a, in a, in a, in a, I mean, systemic, multi-compartmental, I mean, approach. And now I would like to express my severe thanks, of course, to colleagues who contributed to, I mean, various parts of this, uh, of this, um, I mean, studies from the Cantonal Hospital in San Galen, from Institute Camille Jordan, from Lyon, from University Pompeo Fabra, from Autonomous University of Barcelona, and from, from and my Russian colleagues from the Lomonosov State University, Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, and Sechenev University. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Gennady, for such an amazing talk. Really, really 
a lot of uh, interesting work uh, you have presented today. Uh, we have uh, some questions uh, I, in the in the chat. Uh, the first one is from Josep. Uh, no, the first one is from Tomás Alarcón. Mm -hmm. um, he says, very nice talk. And the question is, in your multi-scale model, do you take into account cell proliferation? If so, how do you couple proliferation with the mechanistical part? Yeah, this um, if we, if if the if um, uh, the cell I mean proliferates if there is uh, enough space I mean actually I mean around it to for the for I mean for the daughter cell to be placed there. Okay. So if I understand there is uh, proliferation always occurs in, in the space basically. So yes. cells keep together one yes. to another if there is a space. Okay. So if uh, Tomas wants to expand something, just yeah, simply jump into the discussion. Uh, if not, uh, the second question was from Josep. Mm -hmm. uh, very interesting talk. And um, the question is about the HIV PDL1 mathematical model in the plus computational biology paper. And he said, have you explored dynamics in a wide way? That is, do you have simple dynamics achieving equilibrium points or other more complex behaviors such as oscillations that can appear uh, turning the parameters? Yeah, thank you for the, I mean, for the question. The thing is that, um, I mean, the, I mean, the short answer is uh, no, and the reason for that is the following one, because these basic, I mean, phenotypes of, um, excuse me, the, I mean, basic phenotypes of uh, infection, of HIV infection are expressed in terms of the, of the, I mean, viral, of the steady state viral load. And this and the uh, oh I mean quasi steady state viral load and CD4 T cell T cell count so we had to to uh, to work these are these are the um, this is the actually the clinically based uh, I mean categorization of the I mean phenotypes so we only worked with the with the with the I mean steady state and and we analyzed um, uh, how how the 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 steady states depend on individual parameters of the model. And by analyzing, by why I mean analyzing the sensitivity of the steady states, we delineated the most the most critical parameters which uh, can be used in order to explain the transition between different phenotypes. So between the I mean different uh, steady states, uh, quanti uh, quantitatively different. It's the same steady state, but 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 they are quantitatively quantitatively different in terms of the CD4 T cell count and uh, um, I mean viral load. And this I mean differences are clinically designated as I mean different phenotypes like long term non progressor uh, non progressor slow progressor uh, or fast I mean progressor okay so we still have a couple, little bit more than a minute in case anyone has another question if not let me ask a quick one maybe I'm uh, I missed something but in your first part of your talk, when you made this present, nice presentation about the you know, network structure of the lymphatic system and the dynamics that you describe in the second part of your talk, have you ever uh, combined both uh, uh, modeling? So you have viral dynamics on a network uh, represented by the, the exactly represented by these uh, networks? Um, actually, uh, thank you for a question. This, 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 this is actually what we, I mean, plan. We had, we had linked uh, the uh, the process in lymph node in a lymph node uh, to to the process in blood, but in a, in I mean, following a compartmental I mean approach, uh, but not exactly using this kind of um, 
of the I mean of the graph model that was actually I mean generated only I mean recently it, it was published just at the end of the, of the last year but but I think that now with this kind of um, of data we can really um, uh, we can really quantify the strengths of and predict the strengths of immune response and the and the uh, and the and the multi-population structure in HIV infection and also um, to a certain degree in uh, SARS-CoV-2, I mean, infection, which is also characterized by, by the spatial distribution across the whole body of the sensitive cells, which expresses AC2, I mean, receptor. So not yet, but we plan to, to do so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So again, thanks, Gennady, for such a fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Uh, we should move to the next speaker, which is Andreas Meyersham. Uh, Andreas is a professor at the Universitat Pompeu Fabra and also the Marcus Institute of uh, Numerical Mathematics. I didn't know that. And uh, he's also going to give us an overview of the system, a systemic overview of the, in today's session. And uh, is an Elnor Tai from the Big Data Institute in at Oxford University. Uh, and she's going to tell us about her recent work on uh, COVID-19 uh, dynamics and, and prevention measures and everything that she's now doing at Oxford. Um, yeah, hello everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm Anel. Uh, we'll be this is going to be, I guess, the easiest of the talks today. A lot to think about. Great talks earlier. Thank you, everybody. Um, so this is a talk about agent-based model that we developed for evaluating the non-pharmaceutical interventions against COVID-19. So first, um, thank you very much for inviting. And let me acknowledge uh, the big number of people whose work made this project possible, along with Christoph Fraser's group, most of whom you see in this picture. Uh, people from IBM UK helped, Faculty AI, uh, Google Research chipped in, the Crick team and the National Health Service contributed to the development of the code and the methodology as a whole. So this project is led by um, Rob and Will. So when pandemic just started, we developed a math model uh, for infectiousness to estimate the basic reproductive number. Uh, but our focus was to quantify the contribution of different transmission routes. So by that, I mean the, uh, the pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic, symptomatic transmissions. So we concluded that the contributions to basic reproductive number uh, included 45% approximately from pre-symptomatic individuals that are um, the individuals before showing symptoms, approximately 35% from symptomatic individuals, around 5% from asymptomatic individuals, those that, uh, that was mentioned earlier, um, that never show symptoms, and around 10% was estimated to be, to come from environmentally mediated sources, such as like market contamination or, and such. Uh, according uh, to these estimates, well, one of our results was that the pre-symptomatic transmissions alone uh, are almost sufficient to sustain the epidemic growth. But this study had also a positive um, outcome. It said that the epidemic can, can be stopped with rapid and effective contact tracing. However, um, our math model didn't allow for um, contact tracing to be modeled because contact tracing is an individual intervention and we needed the model that simulated individual people. Uh, stars aligned and in our group, we already had people who were working on agent-based models. Uh, for example, the one uh, that we're studying the HIV in Zambia and South Africa. So that this allowed us uh, to create open source agent-based model uh, COVID, called COVID-19, uh, open ABM COVID-19 quite quickly. So um, op open ABM was originally developed to evaluate the design of digital contact tracing applications. You, must, you might've heard 
um, for the, uh, this was for the technology division of National Health Services back in April 2020. This, was, uh, this work um, quantified the importance of the rapid test processing and the level of, and we sort of showed the level of uh, up, uptake by the population that was required for these digital contact tracing uh, applications to be effective. Uh, in a further study, this open ABM was used by our colleagues in Washington uh, to investigate the benefits of deploying an application based on Google's exposure notification system. So th that study included a calibration of um, model to county level. And they demonstrated that the digital contact tracing provides benefits even when there is already a manual contact tracing employed. And finally, OpenABM has been used throughout the pandemic by the National Health Service England to model hospital admissions at the regional level in England. So hospital admissions and ICU beds and so on. Um, it never ceased to amaze me where <laughs> your scribbles in your notebook can lead at some point. So um, let's look at some general features on the model starting with, um, let's say, in interact uh, network structures. So in each of the ne interaction networks, individuals are represented as nodes and we have constant and dynamic connections occurring between them. Uh, these interactions uh, happen between, we, we think that they happen between individuals. So the three networks represent different types of um, daily interactions that are household, occupation, and random. Households that are fully connected graphs on the first line you see. Uh, second, occupation can be considered um, as a workplace or schools for kids or regular social environments for older people. And the random networks, um, they stand for some public transport, essential shopping, and so on. The interaction networks have two roles, two very important roles in the ABM. First, the infection can be transmitted between two individuals on the day that they interact. And second, the uh, interactions for each individual are stored and can be used later for contact tracing or for modeling contact tracing. So the distribution of the number of interactions on a um, simulated network by type and by age are shown here on the right. So type at the top and uh, by age at the bottom. So note how the mean number of contact decreases with age as found in all the empirical studies that I found. So another thing is the health system and it's modeled as a care cascade shown in the right here. The disease progression is again, age dependent. This was necessary after, for example, we saw that the deaths in, from COVID-19 were highly skewed towards the older population. So the susceptible individuals after um, interacting with infected individual would pass into one of the routes they would get either asymptomatic infection, mild or severe. That's how we decided to stratify them. When the severe infection doesn't lead to recovery straight away, we admit them into a hospital and um, in a hospital with certain probability, they either recover or go through the intensive care system. Again, all these compartments are age stratified and individuals have probability of progressing down the cascade. And we also have the time that people spend in every one of these compartments, which have been basically meticulously collected from all the available data at the time. Um, in its core, the infection is still spread by interaction between infected and susceptible source and the recipient. The rate of transmission is determined by three factors. So first, the infectiousness of the source is important, which was estimated to peak around six days. The age-dependent susceptibility of the recipient. So the, our yeah, recipient has to be susceptible. And um, the type of interaction, that is, on which network it had occurred. So these values are coming from digging through, again, clusters of empirical studies. 
So all these factors would affect the severity of the disease in a population, and that also depends on uh, the age group. <clears throat> Excuse me. These different um, inputs result in so-called transmission patterns. These transmission patterns help to understand the progression of the epidemic. So transmission pattern illustrate the number of disease transmission events occurring between different age groups. So on the right panel here, the age of a recipient is along x-axis, the age of a source along y-axis. Uh, in this example, brighter colors vaguely along the diagonal line sort of illustrate the phenomenon of similar age groups infecting similar age groups, right? So this is an example, since transmission patterns depend on demographics, network uh, structure, and infection model. And it also even depends on the, which part of the epidemic we're observing, right? So as we saw uh, originally, a, a lot of the infections were occurring among older populations, and now it's with vaccination going towards the younger population. So here's an example of how transmissions can be also stratified by infection status of the source and the age of the source and the recipient. Uh, in this simulation, you can see <clears throat> this is an uncontrolled, I must specify, this is an uncontrolled epidemic. Most transmissions occur from pre-symptomatic individuals with mild disease. And uh, interventions that reduce the rate of growth tr of transmissions will change these relative contributions um, of different symptomatic stages. Note that the largest number of transmissions occur pre-symptomatically, again, before a mild infection in adults and children of secondary school age. So this was the, one of the examples. <clears throat> For uh, the coding gigs out there, uh, we did investigate the sensitivity of the model on the total population and the effect of um, aggregating that population into smaller ones. We estimated that the symptomatic, um, or it's, excuse me, systematic and stochastic variability of key statistics of the epidemic, such as doubling time and uh, fraction infected, uh, were not affected if our subpopulations were big enough. Uh, the results showed that the measurable difference in the main value of the statistics for populations greater than 50 case, <clears throat> 50,000 um, people in the simulation. Sorry, I can't, I can't hear myself in these headphones. Uh, sorry. So um, the analysis showed that the stochastic variation in doubling time was less than 0.2 days and the total number of infected uh, individuals was less than 0.5% for simulations with at least 1 million. So this is Overall, this is good news for those who'd like to run the model on their laptop using different scenarios. So what kind of interventions can we include in our scenarios for OpenABM and how are they modeled? Let's go through that. So OpenABM can model a range of non-pharmaceutical interventions. Uh, given the many types of intervention and interest in introducing them at different times, during the epidemic, the interventions are controlled in, uh, in a simulation dynamically through Python interface. We have also an R interface now. This allows for um, policy interventions to be applied in response to a change in the growth of the epidemic. So for example, uh, stricter policies like uh, lockdown can be applied when prevalence is above a certain threshold. So you can dynamically react to what's happening in your simulation. So let's look at these interventions a bit closer. A proportion of individuals self-isolate upon developing symptoms. So this is what you can do in your simulations. Self-isolation is modeled by stopping interactions on the individual's occupation network. And it greatly reduces the number of interactions in the random network. However, it increases the, um, however, no, self-isolation doesn't actually increase the uh, household interactions. The default time for self-isolation is seven days with daily dropout because we need it to make it more human. Humans don't obey 100% of the time. 
the ABM contains uh, the option to quarantine everybody within the household of the symptomatic individual. The model can also consider individuals without COVID-19, the ones who think they have the symptoms, for example, hay fever or flu-like symptoms, and may therefore self-isolate too. So the figure here illustrates uh, how self-isolation upon symptoms reduces the rate of spread of the infection. Uh, blue is a uh, daily number of daily infected if nobody self-isolates. Orange is if they self-isolate 100% of the time. So uh, hospitalization is another um, intervention. Once admitted to a hospital, patient immediately stops interacting in all of their uh, networks. Uh, in the default model, we currently do not model interactions within hospitals. However, a preliminary model for hospital interactions uh, is now being developed by collaborators and will be refined in the future work. And next intervention is a lockdown. It's one of the big guns. Uh, lockdown is modeled by reducing the number of interactions that people have on their occupation and random networks. By default, two thirds of the interactions get canceled. Additionally, given that the during lockdown people stay at home a lot, uh, the transmission rate for interactions uh, on the household level is increased by a factor of 1.5. So this animation shows the age stratified infection and disease compartments. So you can see how first we have new infections growing on the first row and then when the lockdown is applied with certain delay, we see all the rest of the compartments growing. And it, yeah, it's just a, a little cartoon. Mm. Another intervention that you can apply is shielding. This was uh, as a reaction to one of the policies implemented here in the UK. So contact, contact reduction can be applied to certain age groups. So for example, given that the fatality ratio is highly skewed towards uh, the over 70s, we have the option to uh, apply a reduction in contacts for those demographics only. So in this figure, we see how um, infections can be kept low in shielded group that is over 70s after lockdown is over. So green block shows how lockdown reduces the number of in infections. And when the lockdown is over, we put over 70s into a shielded zone and do not put infected uh, between 50 and 60. And you see how there, there, there is a difference. Um, another intervention is physical distancing or social distancing. Me measures uh, as this uh, and mask wearing, they do reduce the probability of transmission in certain types of interactions, for uh, that is random interactions, but not household interactions, obviously. Uh, and the um, open ABM allows for this to be modeled by allowing for the network specific transmission multipliers. So these can be adjusted during the simulation. Uh, in the figure here, we see example of how infections can be kept low after lockdown with frankly, <laughs> extreme physical distancing measures. But yeah, you can also um, account for not a perfect adherence by changing these multipliers. Uh, the model is able to show contact tracing, both manual and digital. And it um, also operates what is one of the exciting parts of it, it operates with or without an integrated testing system. So the model contains many of the real world imperfections which affect test and contact tracing programs, such as um, test sensitivity and specificity. We have included delays in testing and contact tracing. We have incomplete coverage of the population. We have uh, failure to recall contacts or for example, when contact tracer uh, resources are limited and uh, impartial adherence to quarantine requests by the contact tracers. So 
it also has um, the ability to model recursive contact tracing with and without testing. So by recursive, I mean finding contacts of your contacts of your contacts and so on. If that's what is implemented in your country. Um, so let's look at the three main parts. Testing can occur in both the community and the hospital. Um, tests are assumed to be sensitive from three days post-infection to 14 days post-infection with um, default sensitivity of around 80 and specificity of 99%. This comes from empirical studies. Um, soon will come out uh, our work with John Amazel. Uh, very excited about that. So for community testing, delays can be introduced for ordering a test and then receiving the test testing of an individual in the community is triggered by reporting symptoms and can also be triggered by being contact traced. So the figure here demonstrates the importance of quick testing turnaround. So if self-isolation only occurs after a positive test, you can see that one day lag in a test result um, in comparison to four days lag in test results can can double the number of infected individuals. Another one is, so the digital contact tracing. So as we mentioned earlier, contact tracing is vital to control epidemic with a high level of pre-symptomatic transmissions. Uh, a variable fraction of individuals in each group can be assigned to have a digital contact tracing smartphone app the numbers we used come from the ownership of smartphones that is based on age stratified Ofcom data for the UK. And uh, digital contact tracing can only occur between two app users. Obviously, digital proximity sensing is likely to miss some of the interactions. Uh, so the open ABM when contact tracing uh, drops a number of interactions randomly. For contact, contact tracing, the model takes into account um, all interactions the individual has had with uh, other app users for, for, from the past seven days and the ones that haven't been dropped. Uh, the model can simulate all the different versions of contact tracing algorithms. Um, so the bottom figure here demonstrates how digital contact tracing after lockdown followed by rapid testing could have prevented a second wave uh, even when the average uptake was only 50% of the total population. So the orange line shows no digital contact tracing. Blue line shows only 50% um, app users in the population still would have been nice. Um, next is the manual contact tracing. Um, works in a similar way uh, with a little differences. First, since it doesn't rely on individuals having a smartphone, it can originate from anybody who tests positive. Uh, this is particularly important in the elderly where smartphone usage is lower. However, since the identification of interactions relies on the first case, like index case, recalling them, uh, only a fraction of actual interactions are traced in the model. Uh, in particular, the fraction of interactions recalled depend on the type of interaction. So you will much um, easily recall, will recall your workplace colleague than a random person on a bus. Also, manual contact tracing only occurs after a delay following a positive test. This is to account for contact tracers contacting both the index and the traced individuals. Finally, we also included um, the, the resource depletion. So during a peak in the epidemic, the amount of contact tracing required, uh, it increases. So risk there is a risk of overwhelming the man manual contact tracing service. Therefore, we put uh, upper limit to the number of interviews that contact tracers, tracers can perform every day. 
And in the figure here, we see how a well-staffed manual contact tracing system following a rapid test can lessen the second wave, could have lessened the second wave. Um, and the quarantine is another one. It's similar to self-isolation. Contact traced individuals can be asked to quarantine, which was the default of 14 days, either because they are directly traced or because they are a household member of somebody who has been traced. So like self-isolation, it also um, modeled by stopping interactions on the workplace and uh, random networks. Uh, yet uh, the model includes a daily dropout rate to simulate, again, human behavior. Um, quarantine can be ended if either the index case uh, tests negative or if the quarantined person tests negative. Uh, last but not least, OpenABM has the ability to model the effect of vaccination. Uh, two types of vaccines are currently being modeled, the one that provides full protection and another one that provides symptom only protection. So here you can see uh, total deaths and total infection numbers of the simulated population after the lockdown was over when only 2% of the population was vaccinated. We are currently working on integrating different strains and also cross immunity against those different strains. This is an ongoing study. Uh, so what does the OpenABM provide as an output? So we can, what we'll see here comes from an example simulation. Again, I must highlight that. The model was run on a population of uh, 56 million people with UK-like demographics for the first wave of COVID-19 epidemics in England. So we aggregated 56 simulations of 1 million people. You can do that as I've shown earlier. The infection was seeded and grew exponentially with doubling time of 3.5 days. A nationwide lockdown was introduced when the prevalence was 1.55%. And then we ran the model for another 77 days. So main out outputs of the model include the number of infected individuals, uh, hospitalization, ICU admissions, and deaths. And for the um, aggregate simulation of 56 million individuals, these values can be compared to observed data for England. So additional outputs exist there, for example, the number of quarantine people and number of tests that are required. These are important uh, since the model can be used to compare different interventions. So uh, there should have been some calibrations. Calibrations involved fitting a transmission parameter to that of the doubling time of deaths of 3.5 days that was matched. And um, two-dimensional grid search uh, was performed across the prevalence and at which the national lockdown was implemented and the reduction in daily contacts after lockdown. Uh, it's quite technical. However, uh, here on the right-hand side, we see simulations in blue lines. There are 50 different sim iterations. Um, the beginning of the national lockdown was 23rd of March. Overlaid orange is the data that is um, provisional counts of number of deaths involving coronavirus registered in England, COVID-19 patients in hospital beds, daily hospital admissions from the UK government's uh, COVID-19 dashboard. And uh, this one dot here is the estimated seroprevalence in England from the UK Office of National Statistic. Uh, so what I would like to highlight here is that although there was some calibration for uh, hospital beds and uh, daily deaths and seroprevalence, this hospital admissions data has not been calibrated to and this is how well it matches uh, with minimal calibration. Um, well, well, I understand this is very exciting, but yeah, hold your horses. <laughs> so I was very excited to see this kind of matching. Um, 
so yeah, to conclude, we present here OpenABM, COVID-19, a COVID-19 specific agent-based model. It is suitable for simulating the epidemic in different settings and assessing all these interventions, including contact tracing using the mobile phone app, if that's what you're interested in. The model is well documented with a simple interface, allow non-experts to easily evaluate complex dynamics and strategies. Um, there are a lot of example um, Jupyter notebooks. If you can install Jupyter notebooks, you can run this code. Um, so it is an open source project and is easily extendable. Uh, it has new features that are already being added right now. Uh, the model is fully documented and thoroughly tested in formal testing networks, like the code itself is being tested. Um, yeah, so however, on the downside, the current version of the model doesn't include nosocomial transmissions, um, transmission in care home settings. It doesn't have uh, non-hospital deaths yet. Uh, gender, sex of the individuals wasn't included. We do not consider comorbidities with other uh, diseases uh, or neither did any geographical structure apart from the networks that we've already considered have been included. So, however, all of these limitations are being currently addressed by collaborators and they will become available uh, hopefully on GitHub reasonably soon. Um, anybody can go and have a look at the code on these under these links. Um, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Anel. Uh... Uh, we have uh, here uh, three questions. Uh, first is from Yusef, mm -hmm. and he's asking why the incidence uh, peaks just after the lockdown intervention. And in between brackets, he said, I have seen it in animation. Uh, so, which? Oh, yeah. So, the I, I guess it partially because of the lack. Um, uh, lag in reports, I would say. And um, yeah, basically people react a bit slower to restrictions that have been put. And also uh, it takes a little bit of time for the disease to develop after you catch it. So uh, okay. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um... And then there is another question from Irene Otero Muras, and she's asking if there is a consensus on the percentage of asymptomatic cases. Uh, apparently, different numbers appear in the literature, and is a percentage is a constant, or it depends on factors, on different factors. Um, okay, uh, I'm not sure. I guess it. Yeah, I guess it depends which country we're talking about. And let me see. I'd just like to see the question. Numbers appear in the literature. Yeah. Yeah, so asymptomatic cases are the hazy ones. Um, we're doing as much as we can, but yeah, as you saw, we have this guesstimate and that's how we can, I guess, work it out. But um, yeah, I guess it will come soon. I think there are a couple of studies that I've seen um, that are based on testing so on seroprevalence, but I can't uh, cite them right now, I forgot. Nice. So on the last question from Lena, uh, do you have a proof about the efficiency of the night curfew comparing with the full-time lockdown? Uh, what, what's a night curfew? I haven't heard of that before. Is, uh, is it, is it uh, like half-day lockdown kind of thing? I, I, I guess she refers to that. But... Yeah, yeah. Um, I, yeah, yeah. I see. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, since it's 
UK-based study, we didn't have a curfew, but I would imagine that it's, as far as I can imagine the behavior of the model, it will be just basically proportional to the um, number of interactions that you limit. So if you limit half of the interactions, you're gonna get half of the reduction in the incidence rate, I guess. Yeah. No, I don't know, because it's, uh, people that just get out at night is basically doing more crazy things. Uh, exactly. Like, but virus doesn't care. What are you doing? Well, but the, con the contact rate probably is higher and whatever. I don't know. Yeah, humans being humans. Hmm. So any other question for Anel? Nope. OK. So thank you, Anel. Thank um, you. We are. We got to the end of the of the virus immunology session. I would like to thank all the speakers and everyone that participated in the discussions and also uh, attend all the all the talks. Uh, so thanks a lot to everyone, and I hope to see all of you tomorrow on the next session, uh, which is going to be a bit more mathematically oriented. Uh, yeah, uh, you said, do you have something to add? Well, uh, yeah, no, th thanks thanks for all, all the talks. They, they were really amazing. And uh, well, even they were not very mathematicians, some of them, I am sure that uh, we will have some ideas about modeling and perhaps uh, we can discuss it in Petit Comité. And just to hope to see you tomorrow, uh, we will start at 10 in the session of uh, bifurcations and chaos. And uh, that's all. Thanks so much for everything. Thank you, Santi, for being the chair of the session. And see you tomorrow. Thanks so much. OK. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.